How are you today? So today what we're going to look at is part two of our introduction to the ethics. And we're going to look at Aristotle's concept of human nature. We've already seen the concept of nature in general uh, as applied to the uh, from the physics, but also as applied specifically to the development of human community, the nature of human community itself. Now we're going to look more specifically at the nature of the individual. Now, why is that? Because the politics deals with the the polis, the political community, the, the, the kind of collective, or, collective organism, whereas the ethics is geared toward addressing the concerns and perspective of the individual in uh, their concern for happiness, right? What is ethics? It's the science of human action, moral action. It's uh, the science of human happiness. So let's turn to our PowerPoint. Okay, so my, some of the things we're going to say here today come directly from the ethics, and some things we're going to say are built up as a kind of reservoir of understanding that the Greeks had about human nature that is presupposed in Book One of the Ethics, but not always explicitly stated, uh, particularly uh, aspects of the nature of the soul Aristotle hints at but doesn't spell out. In particular, Book One, Chapter 7, and chapters 13 address the issue of human nature most directly in what's famously called, starting on page 12, the function argument. Um, part of the nature of the thing is that everything has a characteristic function or activity or task or a characteristic work that is unique and distinct to its nature and it is doing that work well that allows it to achieve its goal right? Uh, the goal is the telos. The goal is the destination or purpose of life. And in the case of human life, the goal is uh, the highest good, which is human happiness. And the question is, what is going to allow us to achieve happiness? Um, and what he's going to ask in the function argument on page 12 that goes into page 13, what is the distinct, unique, peculiar functioning of a human being? His answer is going to be very simple. It's going to be our rational functioning. He compares us to plants and animals and says we have all the things that they do, but then we have this icing on the cake or this cherry on top uh, above and beyond what they have, and it's it's reason, right? So how we are, as the rational animal, if our nature is rational, then clearly what distinguishes us as human beings is that we function toward our talos, toward our goal of happiness, uh, rationally, which is to say using reason. And he is definitely not saying that human beings are or should be ro robots, uh, you know, like uh, Spock on Star Trek, where everything is just kind of dispassionately, and that reason is the sole attribute of the, the human soul. It's not the sole attribute, it just happens to be the most important. And um, reasoning comes in many different forms we're going to discover. Okay, so let's step back into it. The Greek word physis is the word for nature. His book, The Physics, is the book where he discusses the concept of nature in general, right? And the important thing is um, this concept is imminent, an imminent concept. It's one, nature can be gleaned through the senses and rational uh, contemplation of the evidence of the senses. We're not talking about anything mystical. We're not talking about anything divine. One of the most striking features of the ethics is that it spells out the right way to live not based on any religious or God-given or divine commandment. There is no ten, There are no Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. There is no Hammurabi's Code coming from the, the civic deity. Rather, we are going to do it imminently by the use of an uh, understanding of our reason. Right? This is really uh, crucial and a quite striking book for lack of any of those types of religious references in a world that's still defined by the connection of religion and politics, uh, defined by having a civic religion in contradistinction to the separation between church and state. The two were integrated. And this is really important because the, the classic Greek word used to describe someone who is happy is connected with the word fortunate. And the word, the Greek word is makarios. Makarios, and that word means blessed, 
And how or uh, what does it mean to be blessed? It means to be ordained uh, with good fortune by the gods, right? And that happiness was not something you made through your own active achievements, but rather was a dispensation from the gods over which you have no control, a kind of providential uh, fate uh, that's given to you by chance from the gods, at least from your perspective, rather than the result of your own accomplishments. Aristotle, in discussing happiness, does not use this word uh, makarios, blessed, which has this religious or divine connotation and a connotation of chance. He uses the word eudaimonia, eudaimonia. And his conception of happiness is something that a human being doesn't just get by chance or good luck or good fortune, uh, like winning the lottery. Rather, it is an active achievement through the use, ultimately, of our reason. So therefore, this whole concept of nature ties in because nature deals with the world of our senses and not some kind of supernatural world. Um, we've talked about the nature of a thing is its permanent essence in contradistinction to its an accident. So, for example, a seed that ends up on a street does not get to fulfill its nature uh, because of the accident of having fallen on the street and it never allows to get implanted in the ground and germinate and grow. And he's going to see the human being very little different from an acorn or a seed that if planted in the proper soil, if cultivated, culture comes from the word cultivated, in the right way has the chance to grow and develop and realize its capacities. Because nature, is, in the human nature, is not a fixed thing. It is uh, not just a process of motion like a planet. It is the growth toward a goal through a process of maturation or education. And the two key concepts that educate us through experience uh, Right? We talked about in the uh, Sapiens that human beings have the capacity to be educated and learn from experience. And those two f f form, uh, formational uh, or formative experiences for Aristotle are one going to be habituation and two uh, learning or study type of what, what would really be a kind of more formal education in speech. And uh, habituation is going to be associated with moral virtue. And study is going to be associated with intellectual virtue. So there's two sets of virtues we discover in a human being, and they get uh, we are informed with them or formed by them in two different, uh, you could say, educational approaches. Okay, so let's just rehearse a little bit. Everything's nature has three central components, a talos or a goal or a final purpose that is the cause of all its actions, an ergon, a characteristic function, and arete or virtue or excellence, right? Uh, our happiness is talos. It's what we want. Our ergon is the characteristic functioning that helps us achieve our end that's distinct to our nature rather than the nature of another type of being or another type of animal. And the characteristic functioning is a, a means to an end. And notice we've talked about the distinction between means and ends, and ends are superior to the means because the means are just the things you use to get the end, and the end is the thing you really want. Arate, uh, excellence. Right. So when we speak of moral or intellectual virtue, we're talking moral intellectual excellences. And really, these excellences can be described as something like faculties or capacities uh, or um, uh, aptitudes for certain abilities. So we have a capacity for moral excellence and we have capacities for intellectual excellence. Right. And you notice the word excellence signifies doing it as well as possible or as perfectly as a human being can can do it. So we said that in book one, chapter seven, that Aristotle, it's just famously called by scholars, the function argument. He is going to try to pin down the characteristic or unique functioning or ergon uh, of the human being. And for us, what's functioning is a rather dry word. It's living. We live in a certain way relative to other animals. Let's just be clear on what these terms mean in their practical application. And examples always help illustrate those things. So what is the nature of a knife? A kind of ridiculous sounding question, right? Because it's so obvious. The goal of the knife is to cut the thing. 
and not just to come close to cutting the thing or not to just look like it's cutting something but to actually cut the thing the ergon the characteristic function is cutting and its excellence is the thing that allows it achieve its goal uh, which is likely you could say its sharpness or any aspect of it that really allows it to achieve uh, its goal. So this is an important distinction. What a knife really is, is the thing that actually cuts, not the thing that just looks like it could cut or the thing that was apparently designed to cut, but the thing that actually does the job. And this is important for Aristotle's, uh, his higher understanding of human nature, such that if rational functioning is what defines a human being, it's really those people who utilize their reason in the appropriate way that are really fully human. And this is a kind of aristocratic distinction that we, we would not be inclined to make. But if you think about it, um, uh, happiness is only achieved through taking the reins rationally of your own life and choosing the life you have rather than it just coming to you by accident. Okay. So here we have a visualization of this process of development and growth with its relevant components that you can see it's clearly. Now notice this is a cycle or a trajectory and it's not from birth to death. It's from birth to, to our peak of performance. Um, so you think of uh, what is the nature of the oak? Is it in the acorn or is it in the tree? And Aristotle says, no, it's not in this incipient uh, raw material of the seed, but it's in the full development of what the seed will become. So nature is, on one hand, identified as this process of growth, but he says in this, the physics, it's more specifically identified with, you could say, the peak performance of the, of the organism at its most perfected state of matura maturation. So what we're really talking about here is not just the process of growth, of getting bigger and getting older, but a process of uh, psychological, the development of the soul. Uh, so it's a process of education. And our goal here, this wonderful little target, is happiness. That is our telos, that is our end. And what does happiness for Aristotle really consist of? It does not consist in simply a feeling of contentment. It, it consists of a state of completion and perfection of our, of our natural faculties, the, the fulfillment of our given capacities, the realization of the raw abilities that we have. And how do we do that? So here, we do it through working and working hard, right? He says, uh, the kithra, the musician is the one who plays the instrument, but the serious mu musician is the one who wants to play the instrument well. And that playing it well is achieving happiness. So he's really, he starts to mark out a distinction between those human beings implicitly who merely kind of walk through life in a passive way and seek to just get by, kind of, you know, the whole attitude of getting by and doing just enough, versus those people who take the reins of their life to really self-consciously and actively achieve a certain goal through a certain, a, 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 an intense amount of exertion, right? Now we're gonna do that. We're going to use our rational faculties in some way, shape or form. So now we get into the details of what what is a human being? What is a human being? Very simply, uh, Aristotle, the Greeks say, human being is uh, consists of a, a two parts. It's a, a dualistic being, and we're going to see this dualism as a real problem for ourselves in determining what is right in our life and a challenge to achieving uh, happiness or the good life, because with two parts, at least two parts of ourselves, it turns out we have different motivational sources that are going to pull us in different directions and raise questions that we're going to be forced to think about, to deliberate, to reflect on, and try to determine or to discriminate what goal or what end or what course of action, what impulse that's going on inside of my psychology should I, should I act on? The body being the physical thing, the soul being all those psychological elements uh, that make us who we are psychologically. You could say the mind, the soul is really the mind and the heart together, right? And this, the soul is a thing, you see the second point here, that cannot exist without the body 
uh, but is more than merely our body or physical existence, right? So there's no, yes, the Greeks entertained the idea of an immortal, immaterial soul that you know flew off to heaven when you die. But when Aristotle typically talks about the soul, it is simply a product or byproduct or function of, of the body's capacities. And when the body is dead, uh, the soul is dead with it. So we're not talking about some kind of d divine thing here. Um, however, uh, it is a necessary concept because it seems like what a human being most is, because they have the power of thought, because they have the power to reflect on their own experience, what we most are is not simply our body. So if you asked uh, a person to describe who they were, what, what is your true self? What, what are you really? They're not just going to import, import to their physical body. They're going to talk about things that are immaterial or invisible, right? So the body is visible, but the soul is invisible. And it's manifest through our actions. It's manifest through our words. And if we're our, speaking from our own point of view, it's manifest in our own internal life that other people don't have full access to. But all those things are highly uh, lacking in uh, tangibility, right, uh, or visibility. We glean it through various behaviors, but we, we don't see it directly. We see it. We see its products, you could say. And I think most people would say that that is where your true self lies. OK, so, you know, the Greek word soul, psyche is where we get our word psychology, which is really, honestly, the science of the soul. It's just all those psychological things that um, are above and beyond our biology, even as our biology makes them possible. On the most basic level, the Greek word soul uh, is very simple. It is understood as the animating principle of all things that are alive, right? So the Latin word for soul uh, and they had a very similar, the Romans had a very similar concept of the soul as the Greeks. Uh, the Latin word is anima, anima. And it's where we get our words animated or animate. And things that are animated are alive rather than dead, right? A rock versus a plant versus a dog versus a human being. Um, beings that are alive have a soul. Uh, and being alive allows things to uh, do things that inanimate things can't. And if you look at, you know, the natural sciences today, they still don't have an ironclad and crystal clear explanation for what makes one thing alive and another thing uh, not alive. I mean, for example, the coronavirus is a really interesting thing. Um, uh, a virus is not a bacteria. It does not have all the components necessary to sustain itself as a, a, as a completely living thing independent of a host. So uh, a virus actually sits on this precipice or this knife's edge between uh, animate life and inanimate object. Uh, things that are, have souls are animated, they're alive, they breathe, right? The breath of life in Adam is like a, a signifier of many things, but on the most basic level, it's the distinguishing feature of, of, of living uh, animals. And importantly, that uh, living beings, they don't just move, but they develop, grow, and mature. The soul turns out to have, well, when we look at Aristotle's ethics, he most of the time speaks of the soul as having two facets to it, or two components. But it's clear in much of his discussion that he really relies on three components that are talked about in Plato, his teacher, more explicitly. And for some reason, he doesn't go into the detail. But these three parts, so you can see it as a bipartite or two-part soul or a three-part soul. Okay, bipartite, very simple. There's reason, and there are those things that are not rational, logos and a logos. Those non-rational components are the passions. Right. So there's reason and the passions. And what are passions? Passions are impulses. They're animal instincts. And the passions are the things that make us exactly identical to other animals because they exhibit and uh, undergo these same types of various, various types of passions, both bodily and emotionally. Um, reason uh, is the superior part for Aristotle. He says reason in the soul should be the ruler 
over, first of all, the soul should rule over the body like a master rules over a slave. And then he says, within the soul itself, he says, reason should rule over the passions. Reason should rule over the passions like a master should rule over the slaves. And here is the reason why, right? Aristotle, number one, always identifies our human nature with the higher or highest part of us, right? So the soul, because we have a special type of soul, is superior to the body. And therefore, he's going to say the goods of the soul are superior to the goods of the body. So, for example, the pleasures of the soul are superior for Aristotle to the pleasures of the body, right? Why is reason superior to the passions? Well, the first thing is that other animals, as we'll see, experience these same passions or impulses or instincts or emotions, right? We're talking about emotions. Reason, however, is that thing which is distinct in human beings and therefore special and therefore has, just for that fact alone, has a special status. The next thing about reason is that reason is able to discriminate and have rational foresight and make judgments that the passions are not able to make. The classic expression is uh, the passions are blind in their impulses and desires and reason is the thing that has the capacity to see and judge and determine the rightness of the things that the passions desire. So we all know in life, and you should think of your own life here for a second, of all those things in your life that you, at one time or another, you are aware of having a strong impulse. You really want something, whether it's food or alcohol or sex. You think of something really powerful, something really strong. And uh, while your body is saying, boy, that would be really great. Your mind is sitting there saying, I can see the rational, con I can see the consequences that are going to unfold if I partake of this action. And as much as one part of me is telling me I have a desire for this, my rational foresight, which is just think the thinking through of the consequences, nothing terribly fancy here, uh, leads you to conclude that maybe that's not the wisest course of action, right? Should I have one beer or should I have six beers? Well, last time I had six beers, I didn't feel so good after it. So I would like a drink, but I'm only going to have two beers tonight, something, something like that. Right. So you notice immediately the soul is in conflict with itself. It has competing motivational sources. So to say that the soul has two or three parts is not to say that there is like physical or geographical sections of the brain and body cordoned off with these functions. Rather, these are three, two or three different types of motivational sources within our soul, within our psychology. And let, let's be perfectly honest, you can read the fanciest, most cutting-edge psy psychology of today. And while they have learned, uh, they've learned a tremendous amount about the um, infrastructure of the brain and the various parts that it, uh, various functions that parts perform, um, these basic uh, motivational uh, sources have not really fundamentally changed in 2,500 years. Okay. Does Aristotle despise the, the emotions? Does he despise the passions? No. What he's only saying is that the appropriate passion to give into or to succumb to, the appropriate desire to, to uh, act on, is one that has also been authorized by uh, your reason. Right? So passions, what does it mean passions are blind? Uh, let's put it this way. Passions want what they want. And they don't think about the consequences of what they want because that's not their job, right? They just want. And it's reason that sits there, you could say dispassionately, and determines uh, the positive or negative consequences. Uh, does this, does fulfilling this desire benefit me or does it harm me, right? And it turns out that reason itself is going to be a kind of a passion because reason, uh, each part of the soul is going to have a certain object or telos of desire that it seeks, which explains why human beings uh, both desire the range of things that they desire, but also that these desires are in conflict with one another. So the rational and non-rational can be divided up into logos on top or reason. Now we think of speech, logos, the word logos means speech and reason together because we reason in speech. 
And it's really that process of rational reflection. And reason can be used in two ways. It can be used instrumentally as a tool uh, such that the lower desires, the thing called thumos and epithumia, uh, tell reason or tell the intellect what they want. And then reason devises the best way to get it. So instrumental reason is, I don't, can, I don't use my reason to consider the goodness or badness of my action. Uh, I want to rob a bank. I'm just, that's what I want. That's my gut reaction, my gut feeling. I want to rob that bank. And my reason says, hmm, how can I best rob that bank and get away with it? Well, let me devise a plan. Let me calculate out a plan where I can get away with it. Right? So that's instrumental reason. Another form of reason is, it's, it's a clunky term, but end determining reason. And our ends are the goals of our actions, our, our telos, our telori, right? So uh, in another version of this story, uh, my desire says, I want to rob a bank. And my reason says, hmm, let's pause a minute. I know you really want to do that, but is this the proper end of your actions? What are the consequences going to be? And maybe there is another end that is more appropriate. Maybe you can satisfy this desire without risking being thrown in jail. Maybe you can, I don't know, play a video game or play poker and win some money or make a bet or some such, right? So end determining reason questions the ends of your desires and redirects them and potentially reformulates them when reason is in control, right? And so we can just, oh, so thumos, spirit, or spiritedness and epithumia, appetite. What are these things? Each part of the soul can be understood as a distinct motivational source. What is reason desire? It desires knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. So, I mean, Aristotle says in the opening of his Metaphysics, human beings, because they have reason, it is natural for them to be curious and desire to know. It's a very simple phenomena. We have a tool of understanding, and because we have this tool, or even it's kind of a power, we want to use the power. Simple as that. And even the most incurious person has some des natural desire to understand the world around them, either for practical reasons, but here we're saying understanding for its own sake, that human beings take pleasure and have curiosity to understand the world simply for the pleasure of the ability to exercise the ability to understand the world around them. Then there is thumos, or spiritedness. Uh, spiritedness is really a form of anger, right? And, uh, or self-assertiveness. Uh, and as a form of anger, we can ask the question, and uh, it can be all, all these things can be positive and negative these because they're just motivational sources we have to determine what the right object is but uh anger uh we can raise a simple question why do people get angry why why do people get angry i think the simple kind of universal answer is um one gets angry when other people or the world do not recognize our will or recognize what we want our will has been thwarted um, the world hasn't capitulated to our conception of what we want to see happen, right? So spiritedness is a kind of self-assertiveness bordering on anger that de that we demand and desire of the world and the people in it that they recognize our status, our worth, right? So we've talked about this concept of recognition, honor, glory, uh, coming from identity politics, right? So you think of what is an ambitious person? They want to perform great deeds of one kind or another in order to be recognized. So you think of like a billionaire. A billionaire doesn't want to just have a billion dollars. They want to be known for having a billion dollars. So Thumos is a very important um, uh, pass, passion because it is a social passion, right? This is something Hobbes, uh, he, he despised the, the passion of glory. But you notice we've talked about in the politics how it's needs that initially bring people together out of a cold calculation of self-interest. We want to survive. And when we look at Hobbes, we see the same thing, a kind of cold calculation of the needs of survival and self-interest that bring us into alliance or partnership with other people. 
Thumos, however, makes us concerned for the opinions of others. And by making us concerned for the opinions of others, in fact, we're, we're going to be willing to modify our own conduct uh, because we're concerned with what other people think of us, right? So think about, you know, if all the people you loved, uh, if you had just performed an action and all the people you loved condemned you for having done the wrong thing, you would take that into serious consideration and probably modify your conduct because of the, the degree to which you're concerned for your own well-being that they think uh, that they think well of you, right? And this raises a, a question we're going to come back to in friendship, which is uh, whose opinion of you really matters? Whose opinion of you really matters? In the American kind of individualistic ethos, uh, we have this rebellious streak, the kind of Wild West. Uh, I am the evaluator of my own self-worth and other people's opinions be damned. But Aristotle here makes the basic observation that uh, the way we understand who we are and what we think of ourselves is largely dependent on what other people think because we're concerned to be recognized. We see ourselves through the eyes of others and therefore we see our own identity, not just through our own lens, but through it reflected in the eyes and the gaze of other people. Epithomia bodily appetite desire for first of all the needs of survival we need food we need drink we need sleep we need sex we need sufficient shelter and warmth right if we're freezing cold we we want warmth because uh, not just because it feels good because if we're in too freezing cold we will die we'll die out in the snow or something you know in the arctic tundra or something like that but then of course epithumia or appetite um can go from needs things that are necessary to things that are just pleasurable and, uh, you know, the difference between a glass of water in our need to hydrate ourselves to a glass of wine, which is something that is not necessary, but seems to be naturally desired by almost all animals. So we see in these three motivational sources uh, the immediate cause of conflict. We're also, when we get to Aristotle's definition of happiness, we're going to see uh, that the three lives, the three lives emerge from these three motivational sources in the soul that everyone has, right? Um, uh, you are what you eat. You know, we say you are what you eat, but uh, in terms of, and that's your body. But in terms of your soul, you are what you desire. The thing you desire is going to be determined by the part of the soul in you that dominates. And uh, the part of the soul that dominates is going to dictate what you want and therefore dictate your actions to go and get it, right? So a, a person who's driven to uh, the, the life of pleasure and the life of the body and eating and drinking, they're going to arrange their entire life, all their actions around that core goal, and they're literally going to become an expression of what they desire. And if we're thinking about human happiness, uh, you know, what, what do women want? What, what should human beings desire in light of the fact that they are human beings? What is the good life of a human being in light of what human nature is? So when we look at the three lives, we'll see the life of contemplation, the life of politics, and the life of pleasure. And they mirror and reflect a life, number one, driven by reason, Number two, driven by thumos and the desire for honor and recognition. And number three, the life driven by bodily appetite, which would be the life of pleasure. So here is this great uh, little sculpture from the 8th century uh, BC in which there's two classic interpretations of this by art historians. So one is, uh, it's one of the labors of Hercules. It's called the Centauromachia. It's a battle between the man and the centaur. So a centaur is a half human, half animal being. And obviously Hercules was a, a human being who became a god, right? So that's one interpretation. But another interpretation art historians have given this is that this is uh, an externalization, a kind of personification of the struggle, the conflict, the war going on within the human soul between reason and the passions. And this animal creature 
this animal creature, uh, the centaur, which is half horse, being a, a representative of those animal passions within our soul that we hold in common with any other mammal, right? So what is the struggle of human existence? It's the struggle between reason and passion. And really, this is a struggle between um, rational self-restraint and self-governance based on reason in regulating the passions, not denying them, not, not being a Puritan. Aristotle, we saw in the outline, pleasure is very important. He has a discussion of pleasure, and then friendship, and then pleasure again, and then he concludes the entire Nicomachean Ethics with a discussion of happiness. So it's very obvious that pleasure is connected with, um, with happiness. Uh, Aristotle is not the philosopher of self-abnegation, of radical self-sacrifice, of martyrdom. It's clearly, uh, he clearly has, uh, he cherishes and celebrates uh, our, our imminent world and the pleasures that come with it. It's just which pleasures and which desires really matter for him. Okay, so connected with this conflict, this is actually the opening passage of Homer's Odyssey. And before there were philosophers in ancient Greece, there were poets. And the poets were the wise men of Greek society before the philosophers came along and really attempted to displace them. Plato and Aristotle were intimately familiar with the works of Homer and the Greek myth, uh, Greek mythology. That, that's the base of their wisdom and knowledge. That's, their, that's, the, that's the central part of the library. Uh, Homer was the Bible for the Greeks quite, quite uh, pointedly. And uh, the opening word of the uh, Odyssey is the word man, and a certain type of man. But it raises immediately that the Odyssey, uh, one of its central themes is human nature as such. And Odysseus, the man, and you notice his name's not mentioned here, is a man of many twists and turns. And this expression has, has many meanings. Uh, and it, they apply specifically to Odysseus, the central character, but they more generally also apply to human nature. Human nature is uh, fraught with twists and turns. Our lives are fraught with twists and turns, trials and tribulations, a series of detours. This whole trajectory toward perfection uh, does not consist of a simple straight line. As we all know, our lives do not consist of a simple straight line that have been, that's been planned out since the beginning. If we want to be happy, we have to know what happiness is. And quite frankly, we, we the, the premise of the ethics, as we've already mentioned, is you don't know, you don't know what happiness is. And part of that is a lack of reflection on our part. Part of that is a lack of education on our part. But the other part is uh, the lack of life experience to determine what happiness really is. And of course, at different stages of life, happiness is is uh, is a different things depending on our needs uh, aristotle is keen to acknowledge the developmental nature uh, of our life and and our changing needs and we'll see that particularly in books eight and nine um, but we're a being of twist and turns and the greek word that's used for that's translated as twist and turns is polytropos polytropos poly like a polymath or uh it means many, right? Many, uh, diverse, multiple. Tropos means turn or side or way or way of life, right? But what is Aristotle concerned? He's concerned with the good life. And then the question becomes, what is the right way of life to achieve the good life? A human being is polytropos. Uh, we're multifaceted, where we have multi, and we've just seen the three parts of the soul. The soul has three motivational sources that are in conflict with one another. We have various facets. We're not uniform. We're not simple. We are a complex being. We're complex, but complexity brings complications. We're convoluted. We have uh, one of the problems because we have the ability to rationally or consciously direct our life is what should we do with it? Right? And the answer is, I don't know. Right? Uh, animals don't have to deal with this question because they can't even raise it. They live a kind of singular, directed existence based on based on uh, instinct and a very minimal degree of habituation. So this is a, a profound problem for the human being trying to determine what's right. 
uh, we are and therefore our life is complex but also complicated we are multifaceted beings in which we can traverse many trajectories in our life at any given moment we feel like I could do this or I could do that and that could really radically change our, my whole identity my whole my whole life and so on Plato really illustrates this conflict of these distinct three motivational sources in this passion excuse me in this passage from uh, Plato's laws so I'm going to read it and just to set it up here he's trying to talk about what a human being is in their soul what what does their soul look like and he describes us as a divine puppet uh, you could think of us as we're a puppet of the gods or we're a puppet of nature right uh, if we think of an other animals they are uh, completely confined to being puppets of nature uh, what is, what is a puppet or a marionette there are strings attached to them which direct their actions independently of their own agency or their own decision making or their own choice or reflection right there's there's uh, an outside force working on them right and animals are directed by physical and biological laws whereas human beings are directed by moral codes and laws an important distinction right so we are the divine puppet and what are those strings what the, the metaphor of the strings what are they those are our different motivational sources the various parts of our the various passions we undergo but then also our capacity to reason and all these strings right they're going to move us one way or another he says let's think about these things in this way let's consider each of us living beings to be a divine puppet put together either for the for their play that's the gods or for some other serious purpose which we don't know right isn't this the problem of human life why are we here what is our purpose what should we do even if we identify happiness as our purpose it's still not terribly informative but what we do know is that these passions that we've been talking about work within us like tendons or cords drawing drawing up and pulling against one another in opposite directions toward opposing deeds struggling in the region where virtue and vice lie separated from one another right so tendons or cords are motivational sources of our soul whether it's logos thumos or epithumia reason spirit or appetite are like cords or tendons that pull our actions in different directions right in the in the 18th century the great metaphor was they wanted to understand what were the springs the springs of action and they were envisioning like a kind of mechanical metaphor of like a machine that had different springs that would compel it to act in different ways notice the consequence if we follow the right tendon or string or cord uh, we are led toward virtue, which is to say excellence. Or, on the other hand, if we follow the wrong one, we're led toward vice. Now the argument asserts that each person should always follow one of the cords, never letting go of it, and pulling with it against the others. So we have, let's just say we have three cords. We have reason, we have uh, spirit and we have epithumia or appetite and the one we should always follow. there's one he says that we should always follow even in contradiction to the other ones and that by relying on this cord we're pulling in an opposing direction from the others he says this cord is the golden and sacred pool of calculation now the ca the word calculation is related to the word reason what he's really talking about is reasoning and what does calculating have to do with? It has to deal with really, I think, rational foresight. Uh, we feel an impulse, but then what reason allows us to do is to calculate uh, the consequences of uh, succumbing to that impulse and whether it might not be appropriate to modify, not, not, not necessarily suppress completely the impulse, but to direct it in a way where the outcome we can help try to at least uh, ensure, if not guarantee, that the outcome is beneficial rather than harmful to us. He says, and it is called the common law of the city, right? So, I mean, Plato has a concept that what should rule the human individual is reason, and what should rule this, the city, reason. And therefore, law itself should be a manifestation 
of, of the reason of human beings rather than the passions. The other chords are hard and iron, while this one is soft in as much as is golden. So this is really important. The ones that are iron, uh, we're divine or natural puppets. Either the gods or nature is working through us. And those iron chords have no flexibility. Nature dictates that we have certain impulses that will never be changed. But reason is the one that al allows us to uh, to some degree, and, and it's a very ambiguous metaphor, it's flexible, but it's not, it's not like it's cut from nature, right? It just has a certain give that puts us in control rather than our given nature. We have the ability to be educated. This flexibility indicates our ability to be habituated and adapted so that we're not simply reacting on hardwired impulses, but uh, responding to our, our rational discriminations internally rather than the pool of external forces. Uh, it is necessary always to assist the most noble pool of law because reason, while noble, is gentle rather than violent. And wh why is that? Because reason is trying to convince you of the right thing to do rather than bonking you on the head uh, to compel you to do something. Right. So we have freedom in the use of our reason in one sense, not just because we have free will or free choice, but because we can decide to do the right thing on our own without being compelled to do it. And its pool is in need of helpers if the race of gold is to be victorious for us over the other races. So we need things to assist the use of our reason. And Plato seems to indicate the one thing that's going to help is good laws are going to encourage us to live rationally rather than succumbing to passions that are not beneficial toward in, in achieving our happiness. So just to be clear here, he says, moreover, as regards a city and a private individual, it'll be clearer that the latter should acquire within himself true reasoning about these chords and live according to it, while a city should take over a reasoning either from one of the gods or from this knower of these things and then set up the reasoning as the law for itself for its relations with other cities and so on and so forth right so you see you start to see a simple identification here between living a rational life and living a virtuous life and that at its best law should at least on paper be a manifestation of what hamilton says the de deliberative component of the community so now what I'd like to do in conclusion is to look at a few passages where he speaks about our, our rational activity as the defining feature of a human being. So as the rational animal, it's clear that reason is what defines our distinct nature, and therefore reason is the thing that defines our functioning and our way of life or living. Human life consists of not any activity, but rational activity, and fully human life is a life in accord with the fullest and most complete use of our reason. So in trying to clarify our function or our rational function, he looks at the human being in contradistinction to plants and animals. And he says this, So whatever then would be this work? And when he uses the word work, he's talking about our ergon, our characteristic function. And he, his argument, if the function argument is if I can identify the characteristic functioning of a human being, I then can go on to identify what our talos or what our goal is going to be, uh, which is to say happiness and, and what it looks like in its specificity. For living appears to be something common even to plants. So we don't merely live. We do something more. In fact, it turns out we don't just live, we act. Uh, but what is peculiar to human beings is being sought. If we can find our peculiar function, we can determine our peculiar uh, talos. One must set aside then the life characterized by nutrition as well as growth, because that is the uh, life of a plant. If we go forward here, we can see them spelled out. Uh, what he's saying in this passage, a certain life characterized by sense perception would be, would be next, but it too appears to be common to a horse and a cow, and in fact, to every animal. Okay, so the plant has nutrition and growth, right? It lives and it grows. The grass grows, right? But that's pretty much it. 
Uh, an animal has nutrition, growth, and sense perception, right? And this is really important because they perceive pleasure and pain, and they have the same types of emotions uh, as we have, right? This is also why if uh, someone hurts an animal, it raises an important moral question. Whereas if you cut off a branch of a tree or you cut the grass, most people aren't uh, crying compassionately uh, and in pity for, for the tree that's had its limb cut off right? But um, sense perception puts us closer to something we can relate to, and therefore we have an increased concern because it's like us, and we can identify with the animal in a way we can't with the plant, and it's pretty obvious. Um, sense perception is, uh, for Aristotle, particularly about uh, pleasure and pain, and the animal's life. They don't live, they don't act, they just live. They are guided by responses, stimuli responses to pleasure and pain. They seek out pleasure and they avoid pain, pain, and this charts their course. Course it navigates their course on their life toward their destination, right? Human beings have sense perception, but they also have reason, and reason raises our ability to live a moral existence, and which is often described by Aristotle and others as we we act, we have a life of action. We don't just live. We don't just sit there and grow and then die. We act, and action means. Uh, this, uh, act, um, uh, behavior or conduct based on moral categories rather than simply pleasure and pain. We have categories of good and bad, just and unjust, beneficial and harmful, good and evil, right? And these are products of our reason. We can see these realities uh, not with our eyes, but with our mind's eye, with our, with our reason. Uh, and of course, we've established that certain things that are good for you are going to be painful and certain bad things uh, uh, are going to turn out to be very pleasurable. So the concepts of right and wrong, good and bad, do not line up with pleasure and pain. And it's only our rational foresight by which we come to be aware that uh, certain things that are pleasurable for our bodies and even for parts of our soul turn out not to be good or beneficial to our happiness. So we're the rational animal. And here he enters into this discussion. So there remains a certain active life, active action, of which uh, that which possesses reason, that's the human life. And what possesses reason, reason, and what includes it, what it includes what is obedient to reason on the one hand, and what possesses it and thinks it on the other. But since life, the life of reason in the second sense, also is spoken of in a twofold way, one must posit the life of which possesses reason in accord with act, with activity. For this seems to be the more authoritative meaning. What what is he saying here? Uh, the, the distinction between uh, possessing reason, uh, obedient to reason, and and thinking it. Uh, I think one general point he's making here is that all human beings possess reason, and therefore we have a human existence. Uh, but not everyone is obedient to the dictates. If reason determines, not tradition, if reason determines the rules, we should be obedient to our reason. Right, but not not everybody is, right? And if the work of a human being is an activity of soul in accord with reason or not without reason, we assert that the work of a given person is the same kind as that of a serious person, just as it would be in the case of the kithra player. Kithra player, it's, a, it's like a harp. It's a musical instrument. And a serious kithra player, and this would be so in all cases, simply... Uh, where the, when the superiority is in accord with the virtue is at, when virtue is, the virtue is added to the work. For it belongs to a kithra player to play the kithra, but to a serious one to do it well. And we'll end right with that. The kithra, he's giving us an analogy here with this musician. The kithra is an instrument, right? What is our human instrument when we don't have an, a musical instrument in our hands? Our instrument is reason, and it is the instrument that allows us to direct us toward happiness, right? And there are two types of kithra players. There are ones who just play, and there are ones who are serious, who are determined to play well, or determined to play virtuously or excellently. So there are those of us, human beings, who have reason, possess reason, but don't live seriously, right? We pass the time, we go through the motions of life, right? 
And the only the person who's going to achieve happiness is the one who doesn't just function, but functions excellently. And the serious person, just as per his definition here, is that person which you utilizes and re, you, their reason to its fullest and most complete extent. And that's going to ultimately give us happiness, which is the, the passage that we will look at next.